Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 21, The History of Benin. So today's alcohol of choice is soda bee. Soda bee was apparently originally used in voodoo rituals to give the drinker strength, and for a time it was made illegal by the French authorities to prevent soda bee from competing with European liquors. Soda bee is made from the sap of a palm tree, and has a really interesting aftertaste. Soda bee is a 40% alcohol, which is a lot, so I thought it would have a really burning aftertaste, but instead it's almost like a spicy, gingerish aftertaste that is pleasant and goes down easily. I really liked it. Although the fact that I'd have to ship some from all the way from New York will probably discourage me from buying again, but it's good. It also supposedly mixes really well with lemonade and coke, but I just had it straight, so I can't say how good that is. This good alcohol was of course distilled in the Republic of Benin, which is located in West Africa. It is surrounded by Nigeria to the east, Niger to the northeast, Burkina Faso to the northwest, Togo to the west, and the Bight of Benin, which is located in the Atlantic Ocean, to the south. Benin climate-wise is divided between the southern part of the country, which holds tropical wet savannas and forest, and more dry and arid areas in the north, along with some hills and small mountains in the northwest. Benin currently has around 11.5 million people living in it, largely centered in the south near the coast. Ethnically, no groups dominate Benin, with over 40 ethnic groups found in the country. Some of the largest are the Fon people in the south, who make up a little less than 40%, the Aja, who are found on the coast near Togo, who make up 15%, the Yoruba, who are found in the east and make up 12%, the Bariba, who are found in the northeast and make up 9%, the Fulani, who are also found in the northeast and make up 7%, and the Otumari, who are found in the northwest and make up 6% of the population. Smaller ethnic groups include the Kabe, the Dendi, the Ani, the Mosi, and the Sombe. Besides Africans, there is also a small population of Americans, French, Lebanese, and Chinese people living in the country, making up less than 1% of the population. Language-wise, France is the official language of the country, with it being used in education, politics, mass media, and just inter-ethnic communication. However, most people will also speak their own distinct language based on what ethnic group they belong to. Most of these ethnic languages are kind of vaguely related to each other, with many belonging in the Niger-Congo language family, although they might not be mutually intelligible. Very often, people in Benin are multilingual, with it not being uncommon for people in Benin, and especially those that live in big cities, to speak at least three languages. English is a popular language to learn in schools, often due to the influence of neighboring Nigeria, who has English as its official language. Religion-wise, Benin is really interesting to learn about. On paper, Benin is majority Christian, with around 40 to 50 percent of the country practicing some form of Christianity. Catholics, Celestials, Methodists, and Baptists are some of the largest Christian groups, and are mostly concentrated in the South. However, many people in the country will combine elements of Christianity along with traditional African religions, such as Voodoo. Traditional African religious groups are quite large, with estimates ranging from 10 to 60% of the population practicing or combining some element of traditionalist belief that will vary quite considerably depending on the people groups. Sunni Muslims are also another large religious group, with 20 to 30% of the population being Muslim and are often found in the north of the country. Following Beninese history before colonialism can be complicated, due to the fact that many ethnic groups in Benin often weren't united under a single political entity for much of its history, with the entire idea of a Beninese identity not really being thought up until the 20th century. During the first millennium BCE, iron smelting would have been brought into the region. Islam would arrive in the late first millennium CE, with much of the north being Islamicized. It would also begin to see trade networks, built both between people living in West Africa, but also with some connection to the Muslim world, with goods and people being traded about. Slavery would have been a common practice in Benin and generally in Africa as a whole during antiquity and the medieval period. However, slavery in Africa would be fairly different when compared to the plantation-based slavery in the Americas. Slaves in Africa would be treated more like serfs in Europe, with limited rights, threats of violence and forced labor, but they usually wouldn't be worked to death, nor be enslaved based solely on their skin color. Slaves would be taken from a rival tribe after a military defeat, or be given the slave status due to crimes they could have committed, and depending on the society or ethnic group, 
slaves may have had the chance to escape their slave status. Experiences, of course, would vary based on the tribe or individual in charge of the slaves. Some would be more kind, or at least as kind as you can be towards someone you were holding against their will, while other masters would be more cruel and violent. The big point is, slavery was a common practice throughout Benin, but it wasn't industrialized. By the middle of the Middle Ages, which is a funny way to kind of put that, Benin would have been under several different political entities. Parts of the north of the country would have been under several different Muslim dynasties based in Mali over the years. In the south-central region of the country, the Yoruba-led Oyo Empire would have been politically dominant, influencing much of the coast, which would have been made up of a small collection of city-states and localized kingdoms. The Oyos themselves had their capital in neighboring Nigeria. Also, while on topic of Nigerian-based states, I should probably talk about the Benin Empire. Now you may think based off just the name that there probably should be a link between the Benin Empire and the modern day country of Benin. I mean, they do have the same name. But the Benin Empire was found among the Edo people of Nigeria, who are centered a good distance away from the Beninese border. The Benin Empire was an important cultural and military hub in the region, so much so that the Bight south of the empire was named the Bight of Benin, which would later be where the country Benin gets its name from. Also speaking of the Benin Empire, the empire allegedly had this really unique looking flag that showed a man decapitating another man. It's probably right up there with Angola and Mozambique and one of the most raw flags in the world. The flag was found when the British invaded the Benin Empire, and it's debated if this was the official flag of the country or the flag of one of the small people groups surrounding the empire. In the 17th century, a new player would emerge in Benin, the kingdom of Dahomey. Dahomey was founded by the Fon people, who had recently immigrated to the region and began slowly expanding across southwestern Benin. By the 18th century, they become one of the most dominant players in the region, largely because of the strength of their military that was constantly testing itself due to all the warfare in the region. However, for much of its early history, it had to be subservient to the Oyo Empire, who had threatened invasion and slavery for the Fon-led kingdom. The threat of slavery was becoming a greater economic and geopolitical focus for states in West Africa, due to the arrival of the Europeans. The Portuguese were largely the first to arrive in Benin, and they introduced Christianity and the transatlantic slave trade. Portuguese, along with eventually Dutch and British merchants, began paying money and guns for slaves from Africa to be worked in plantations in the Americas, and many African kings realized they could grow rich and strong through this trade. Eventually, in order to stay alive, African political entities had to participate in the slave trade, selling defeated rivals off to the highest bidder, or end up being the ones sold as slaves. This is where Dahomey's impressive military came into play. Dahomey was one of the few West African states that had a professional standing army, and their centralized rule allowed them to consolidate power much better than other West African states. As the Dahomean military captured more slaves, they also began to receive more European arms, which would help further increase their power, allowing them to capture more slaves, and then receive more arms, and then increase their power, and leading to a positive feedback loop. Dahomey was also unique in the role that women played in their society, with females given much greater political power and often served as overseers for local governors. Most famously, a military unit known as the Mino, or as they are often referred to in the West, the Dahomean Amazons, was found in the kingdom and had somewhere between 1 to 6,000 members in its ranks. The ability of women to move up in society was largely due to the fact that since Dahomey was at war so often, it required women to take a much greater role in both political and military life in order to meet the needs of the kingdom. Now, I should probably mention one of the most infamous aspects of Dahomey. As Dahomey gathered more and more slaves to send to the Americas, which at its height would see hundreds of thousands sent off to likely die in plantations across the New World, it became increasingly more difficult to house the slaves before they were sold off. Eventually, to alleviate this problem, there became an annual festival, which saw military parades, a meeting of political leaders, and the mass sacrifice of some of the slaves. The killings would both be a ritualistic sign to the people that the kingdom was strong, and on a more practical level, it reduced the number of mouths they had to feed before shipping the slaves off. It seems somewhere between 100 to 4,000 would be killed in these mass rituals every year, as Dahomey had fully embraced the practice of mass human export. Dahomey's strength would weaken once the slave trade began to die down in the mid-19th century. A lack of slaves meant a lack of European weapons being delivered to them, thus leading to a lack of power. The French began moving into Benin, taking the city of Porto Novo, which was its own small kingdom at the time, and the city today is the current capital of Benin. The French moved into the region largely just to prevent the British from taking it, and to increase France's prestige. This led to war with the Kingdom of Dahomey in 1890. 
However, the Dahomean military was crushed, and in the Second War in 1892 to 1894 led to the end of Dahomean independence and the start of French rule. The French would then take the north along with the rest of the country, with what we now know as Benin being fully conquered by the start of the 20th century. French rule was characterized by the civilizing mission of the French colonial state. It encouraged the spread of the French language and Catholicism, along with exporting the French legal system over and societal norms. The French would give limited education to some in Benin, but this was often among a very select few, and generally the average Benizian person wouldn't see the benefits of such a system. While in the early 20th century some labor and nationalistic groups would begin to form, they remained both largely weak and under constant pressure from the French authorities. Benin, or as it was called during colonial times, French Dahomey, had its economy based largely around agricultural exports. This included stuff like cassava, yams, maize, cotton, and palm oil. Agriculture today still remains one of the main industries in Benin, along with fishing. Cities on the coast would see infrastructure improve, and some railroads were built in the country, but this was largely just to help with resource extraction. Also during French colonial rule, there would actually be a tiny fort, São Juan Baptiste de Ajuda, owned by the Portuguese. The fort, found in the city of Oida, was originally built by the Portuguese to help use as a base for slave operations in the region. It was abandoned in 1822, before being reoccupied by a small contingent of Portuguese soldiers in 1865. The fort would remain in Portuguese hands, acting as the smallest political unit in the world, with only two people living there by the time it was dissolved in 1961. After World War II, Africans all over began demanding greater autonomy from their colonial masters, and this was no different in French Dahomey. It received increased autonomy by the late 50s, and in 1960 it, along with many other French colonies in Africa, became independent. The new state would be known as the Republic of Dahomey, hoping to emulate the strength of the old kingdom and call towards a glorious past. The new state was immediately fraught with division, as political factions began to emerge based largely on ethnic and regional lines. Three main factions would emerge, with one centered around the city of Porto Nova, one centered around the city of Opome, the former capital of the kingdom of Dahomey, and one centered around the north of the country. These three groups would compete against each other for power. The north faction first took power before being overthrown in a coup in 1963. After this, the Porto Nova faction took power, before their leader resigned and the Opome faction briefly took over control, and then they were overthrown in a coup in 65. After this, a military commander took charge for several years, before P2 was overthrown in a coup in 67. Another military strongman took charge before P2 was overthrown in 69. The North faction then took power, before its leader resigned, and the Opome faction took control again, and they were overthrown in, you guessed it, another coup in 72. As you can probably guess with all the coups and such, this period in Benin's history was very uncertain, and the economy did not do well. Generally, the country was unstable, and many looked for someone who could bring some semblance of order. And then, with the 72 coup, in came Matthew Karakou, onto the political stage. Karakou would come to power arguing for united Benin, opposed to what he called foreign ideologies, like capitalism and communism. However, ironically, in 1975, Karakou announced the country would move towards becoming a Marxist-Leninist state, sided with the Soviet Union, and changed its name to the People's Republic of Benin arguing that the name Dahomey indicated the country was just for the Fon people, and the new name would symbolize the people of Benin coming together. This actually in many ways worked, and besides an attempted coup backed in France in 1977, the period of ethnic and regional infighting would end for the country. Karakou would get set to work setting up his new communist-aligned state. He nationalized major industries such as banking and the small oil sector in the country. He cracked down on both religious figures, political opponents, both real and imagined, and killed his interior minister after he caught him in bed with his wife. Karakou was actually a kind of strange and funny figure. As mentioned before, he completely switched his position on communism, but he also switched his religious beliefs, being born a Catholic, becoming atheist, converting to Islam, and then becoming a born-again Christian. In many ways, Karakou's ability to change himself was likely just so he could gain new support bases, and just shows how adaptable he was as a politician, which earned him the nickname The Chameleon. But while Karakou was a successful politician, Benin didn't really improve during his time. He admittedly wasn't given a very good hand, but his ties with the Soviet Union left him isolated in West Africa, with the rest of the region largely either being hostile or cold towards the communist-aligned state. His repression of political prisoners and nationalism of the economy also led many to flee in the country, hoping to escape the repressive system Karakou had built. 
By the late 80s, with the Eastern Bloc struggling to maintain itself, and the economy failing to significantly improve, Benin began to experience protests from the opposition, and Karakou stepped down in 1990, and the modern-day Republic of Benin was proclaimed. But Benin post Karakou wasn't sunshine and rainbows. The economy was still weak, and while there was now multi-party elections, many still felt dissatisfied. So, in 1996, guess who wins the election? That's right, it's our old friend Karakou, who managed to win support from the north of the country and his historic backers. He wouldn't bring back communism or anything, but it's still kind of crazy that a former dictator managed to re-win an election. He would continue to lead the country until 2006, when he left office due to term limits. In 2016, the current president of Benin, Patrice Talon, would be elected. Talon would grow a fortune in cotton, before becoming an economic administrator to the president preceding him, Thomas Bonnie Yai. Although this relationship would break down, after Talon was accused of attempting to poison Yai, Talon would become elected and begin working to expand the economy and grow foreign investment. This has in some ways been a success, with the GDP and HDI increasing, but not really by a whole lot. Poverty is still very much present in the country, and it seems it will be a long and difficult journey for Benin to grow. Talon had originally come to power on the promise that he would set up stricter term limits and rules around the presidency. However, after he managed to get an entirely loyal parliament in 2019, after an election where only two political parties that backed the president were allowed to run, Talon backtracked on many of these proposals limiting his power. Recently, in the election earlier this year in April, Talon won with 86% of the vote, after restricting who could run and suffering from protests from the opposition. Talon will continue to lead the country for another five years, where it is unclear what will happen after that. Maybe he will step down, maybe he will run again, who knows. So why does Benin exist? Benin has quite frankly been through a lot. Mass depopulation due to slavery, colonialism, political turmoil, and poverty all have contributed to the country's suffering, but also how it has developed. Its struggles created the conditions for both the Kingdom of Dahomey, into French colonialism, and into its post-colonial history. Hopefully corruption and poverty can be significantly reduced in the country, Benin can flourish, and the days of suffering will be behind the people of Benin. Up next, we will go east to Bhutan, Prepare for mountains, Buddhism, and dragon kings. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you then. So yeah, that was the history of Benin. Up next, I'm going to be doing Bulgarian political parties. Originally, I was going to do Slovak political parties, but Bulgaria is going to have an election pretty soon, and I want to get a uh, video out before that happens. So I'll do Bulgarian parties, Slovak parties, and then I'll talk about the history of Bhutan. And then I also have plans to do uh, Canadian political parties and British political parties and just continue on from there. But yeah, thank you for watching. If you want, you can email me at why do countries exist for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are AFP's article on Patrice Talon, King of Cotton, Black History Month's article on the Kingdom of Dahomey, Cornell University's page on the curious history of slavery in West Africa, France 24 News Report, Benin looks back on its links to colonial slave trade, Geography's Now's video on Benin, Home Team History's videos on Dahomey, a barbaric African kingdom, and the Benin Empire. Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History of Benin. A New York Times article on Matthew Karakou. Nigerian Scholar's tutorial on West African colonial administration. Unseen Benin's page on culture and traditions of the Benizian people. Volca Mapping's video on what each nation wanted from the scramble of Africa. Wikipedia. And Wonders documentary, The Mysterious Voodoo Communities of Benin.